Hi there. Thank you for downloading, listening to, and watching the Lean Into Artcast, the show where a couple of visual storytellers get together and take on various topics that tend to bubble up when one embarks on this endeavor of communicating with images. We think hard about this stuff, so you will too. My name is Jersey Drozd. I am a, I am a cartoonist and a teaching artist, and the other host is... <laughs> hey, I am Rob Stenzinger, and I am a user experience designer, and I like to make video games can't stop myself from doing other things too i don't know what can i tell you what can i say it sure is fun to make stuff and then think about it in this format and this is another thing we make this this yeah. uh here we are this podcast <laughs> <laughs> yeah. here we are again and so uh every week or so we t pick a we try to like pick a single topic and just kind of drill down as far as we can on it Look at what it likes. Look look at what it looks like to participate and enact this particular topic. So if it's like, oh, we're going to talk about penciling this week. What does it look like when you pencil? Um, we're going to look at uh, mind mapping this week. What does it look like when you mind map? And then the second half of the show, we talk about how we think about that topic. So diving into the demo first, and then the thinking second. So uh, Rob, do you want to just you want to just dive into this one? Yeah, I think so. It's. Uh... Yeah, I mean, our our uh, our topic, right? Mm -hmm. Let's let's go for it, right? This is a this is like a Jersey Jersey Dro's home cooking kind of special <laughs> special dish <laughs> that uh, you can't get anywhere else. This is this is going to be a good one. So yeah, so the the topic, if you didn't already know from the title, is uh, sound design and lettering in uh, Clip Studio Paint. And the reason this came up recently, uh, rather, like, I think it was literally today, uh, I had this conversation with a few people on Instagram, I posted an Instagram story yesterday. And, uh, you know, if you want to follow me on Instagram, it's Jersey Drozd. And I have the image up here, I was I was uh, doing the lettering on a page before diving into the penciling. And I shared a little bit of that process, I hid the pencils, and I just showed like what the finished lettering looks like when I letter a page. And, um, and actually, I, I removed the word balloons, I this particular image we're looking at is just the sound design. And so some I got I started getting some questions like, Okay, what's it like lettering in Clip Studio Paint? Uh, do you do the sound effects first or the balloons first? And at what part at what stage do you do each of those things? Uh, so I thought, uh, you know, create, this is an opportunity to create something uh, that would hopefully potentially be useful for people down the road if you are thinking about using Clip Studio Paint to do your lettering, or if you already are, here's another way of looking at it. Uh, this is by no means an academic, you know, fully developed six week course on it, but this is like sort of a from the hip look at how I approach it and how I think about it. Is that, did, that, did, I, did I tee that up? Mm -hmm, definitely. I, um, it, this is one of those things that, that comes up from time to time because it's a, it's a huge passion of yours and, and a practice, right? It's not just, a, um, you're, you're, you think really, you really in depth and do some serious problem solving and exploration with how you consider the idea of sound as represented visually. And it's, uh, and so it's awesome to hear your thoughts and it's awesome to see how you execute this. And you have a super in-depth workshop that is available at leanintoart.com slash workshops um, called FATAM. Yeah, it's, we'll yeah we'll, we'll mention yeah. this in the, in the last uh, ad break of the show. But yes, oh, yeah. it, it, this if this topic is of interest to you, there is a uh, workshop you can download at a price if you're choosing at leanintoart.com slash workshops. And yeah, it's it's uh, half practical, half theoretical, like how I think about designing all the sounds in my comics. Um, okay, well, Rob, I think it's time for the transition. <laughs> Is it? <laughs> All right. I forgot my juggling balls. Woo. <laughs> See, I was thinking more like uh, those those torches that those guys in Hawaii spin around. Um, uh, that's another level. I'm not. A, I'm not. Um, uh, I, I don't. I don't toss about sharp objects nor do i toss about flaming objects eh, but probably for the best yeah, right, all right exactly. <laughs> all right so i guess let me try to now that we're in the topic uh let me try to do a screen share so i can actually um is that gonna do it 
Oh, I have to open my window bigger. There we go. Hit share. And there we go. And I'll hide my hangout window. Okay. So let's do 15, 20 minutes on demoing this idea. So what I have not open in front of us is Clip Studio Paint. And um, this is the thumbnail from a comic I did a few years ago. And um, the neat thing, one of the neat things about Clip Studio Paint that we've talked about in the past is that you can uh, toggle your layers to be non-photo blue with just like a button in the upper right of your layer property window. So I have it toggled for that. And now, as you can see on my thumbnail, um, this is my second round thumbnail. We did an episode called Sticky Note Writing, where I talk about the first draft thumbnails that I do on Sticky Notes. Second draft, so first draft, I'm just thinking about, you know, like panel shape and size and like general visual rhythms. But this stage, having figured out those rhythms, now I'm thinking about what are the sound elements and what is the exact dialogue and getting a better sense of what the general poses and acting moments are on the characters. So as you can see on this page, the sound designs, there's, there's, there's a draft of them there, right? In panel one, we have this girl jumping into the air and punching the head off of a giant robot spider. And there's this big crack behind the punch, right? Um, still there, Rob? Yeah, I'm here. Oh, okay. Cool. I, just, I didn't know if I closed my window because I, all I can see right now is Clip Studio Paint. Yeah. No um, and uh, you can see how we'll talk more about visual integration in the second half, but you can see how it, like it overlaps, like the images overlap with the sound design. So it's it's because again, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but like if you've could turned everything in a comic into lines, then everything is unreal, which means everything is equally real, which means the sounds are both there and not there they are real in the sense that they are an aud audible element for the characters in the story but they're as real as everything you drew on the page so like that swipe that our hero is doing in panel one may or may not be what it would look like in real life to punch the head off of a giant robot spider right but by adding that swoosh i've given an implication of power and energy and speed and that this is where lines have kind of like a poetic value to them so i think about this a lot like how are these things interacting with one another right um, quick, and you, you can see question, the, or comment. Yes. So one thing that, that, um, I got all quiet cause I have, um, I use clip studio paint both on my Mac and on my iPad. And I was trying the other day to switch a layer into blue lines quickly. Right. Mm -hmm. And I, you, I just watched you do it. Like here, you, here it is right there in, in the, in the layer palette. And uh, I, I would tell you, I could not find that. So the problem was on my iPad is the layer palette was too narrow. If you drag on the right side of the layer palette, it's wide enough and it shows more of the tools, of the settings. And oh, yeah, the yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, I wanted to mention that. <laughs> um, yeah, there's this little this little button in the layer palette uh, right in the far right of the layer mm -hmm. palette that toggles that on and off to switch it to blue. It's too hidden that get that or too narrow that that gets hidden um but so tell me more about this so there's there's um you have a you have different design constraints different expressions of ideas you, because you've got the word balloons the sounds these um these motion lines and then the the, the um the the subjects uh, the the drawings of people and objects and stuff all in the same place and time mm -hmm. um I don't like like I'm trying to understand more of your thinking about how you I know this is the demo section so this is more mm -hmm. theory stuff but like um and we can save this till then but I'm just trying to understand your thinking about um the jobs of each of those um ways of expressing mm -hmm. e expressing a, a piece of what's happening right and well yeah and Let's let's dog ear some of that for a later conversation in the second half because I am thinking a lot about like visual flow and composition when I'm doing my sound effect placement and when I'm doing my word balloon placement. This is what we call, and Dan Mishkin introduced me to this term, balloon spotting. Um, figuring out where the balloons should naturally go so as to create a sense of flow through the image, right? Where are you gonna go? Right? right. And, it and more readable or, or, or challenging to read potentially, depending on how you depending on what you want right and you know because like right here in this particular sequence we have our older character chastising the younger characters and then she gets interrupted by this balloon and so it overlaps right um 
And I wanted it, this balloon to butt into the balloon before so that it felt very immediate. Like here is this character talking, she gets interrupted, and then there's this soundless pause panel where as this line Yarly is being spoken, as we get to the end of it, now we're here and we're seeing the reactions as to them looking over their shoulders. What are they witnessing uh, upon this character being called, right? Um, so I'm thinking about that kind of thing. I'm talking about, I'm thinking about visual pacing, I'm thinking about composition, I'm thinking about, you know, dialogue choice. How do I get the, for instance, this line here, this, when this guy says weenie, that got changed in the final one. I think here's the final, I changed it to dork, you know? Oh, and I can show you what the final image looked like. So there we have the fully integrated and designed lettering, uh, balloons, and text. So how about I quickly go through how I do the word balloons and then how I do the um, sound sound effects and sound elements. How does that sound? That sounds awesome. Okay, cool. Sound a lot, so, but yeah. <laughs> so the first thing I... So I was asked, do I do the balloons first or the sound effects first? The truth is I do them at exactly the same time. Um, it's it's back and forth as I'm doing the final thumbnail. Um, when I did the, the sticky note version of this panel one, I probably just did the, the punch pose and I just knew I was going to have a sound effect behind it. Or if I didn't, maybe I figured that out when I finally got to doing the final thumb. But um, it's at this stage that I do both the word balloons, the final word balloon placement, final dialogue, and sound design all happen at this stage. And that's why this is, in my opinion, the most mentally taxing part of the job. And it's the part of the job that I love the most and I dread the most. Um, so Quick having question, fin comment, yeah. it looks like you, um, this is a scan of, of something that you, you drew on paper. That is correct. To get to this stage. I do all my thumbnails on paper. I start, I do it on sticky notes and then I take a, uh, a letter size sheet of paper, fold it in half for as many pages I need to do this particular book. I make like a signature of the book and then uh, I use my, you know, long arm stapler, staple it together. And once it's, I'm done thumbnailing, I scan all the pages and then I put them in a folder called thumbnails and then I import them into Clip Studio Paint. Um, so once I got this in here, I figured out my dialogue. So now I can just start typing it. And then in the uh, bottom, of your toolbar, um, the bottom, like the second to last tool, it will be either a word balloon, which will be the you know the text balloon, or it'll be a letter A for text, or it might even be like one of the balloon tails. They nest a lot of tools in Clip Studio Paint, which is awesome because it gets stuff out of your way, but it also makes it hard to find stuff sometimes. So I'm gonna grab my text tool and I'm just gonna tap on the screen or click on the screen, and I'm just gonna go ahead and type this line of dialogue. So don't. Tell me that was not quite almost ever so nearly not bad. Okay. Um, and when I'm penciling in the dialogue, I am trying to think about getting the, the words to conform to a balloon shape, um, but I will change it once I start making the balloon. So um, now I got my type text. I'm going to hit the little circle icon underneath that to indicate that, yes, I'm done typing. I'm going to place it roughly where the dialogue is going to rest. And now we have different balloon tools here that we can use. Now they have the ellipse tool, which just makes like a standard ellipse. And you can set the settings in the tool property win uh, window underneath where you select the different balloons. You can choose what kind of fill color, what kind of line color, um, what the figure is, what's the thickness of the, um, the balloon stroke. So you can make it thicker, right? or thinner um, and you can even change the the fill color the the stroke color after the fact if you want um, and this is a vector which is neat because that means you can also change the busy points on the balloon if you want to give it a different shape if you want to get really nit into nitty-gritty you go into the very last tool on your toolbar where there's a bunch of d different tools nested from like control point pinch vector line but also redraw vector line so i could having drawn this now I just go through and with my pen draw over top of the balloon line and it'll just conform to what i'm doing with my pen mm. so you can do like jagged balloons bursty balloons and so on um I'm just going to undo a couple times and I'm actually going to get rid of that ellipse because the other, the one I use the most, the balloon I use the most is the curve balloon tool, which this is drawing with Bezier points where I click and drag. Oh, let me, I did that wrong. Let me start over again. I'm going to click and drag, click and drag. 
I'm going to do this one more time to describe better what I'm doing. Um, so I'm starting in the left, the left middle, or like the center left of the where the word balloon should be drawn, and I'm going to click and I'm going to drag straight down, just like uh, maybe just past the bottom line of the text. Now I'm going to go to the very center bottom of the balloon. I'm going to click and drag to the right. I don't know if you can see that line, that's, that curve mm -hmm. is being made right now. I think so. And then I'm going to go to the far right of where the balloon should be drawn. I'm going to click and drag up. And it's building a curve as I do this. I'm going to go to the top and click and drag to the left just a little bit. And finally, I go to where I started the line and I click once to complete the balloon. Now I have a balloon that has four points on it that have different Bezier curve handles that I can adjust easily and move the points. And I get this balloon to look, for me, I like it to look a little bit irregular, gives it more of a hand-drawn look, even though it still doesn't look as good, you know, it doesn't look quite as analog as real analog. But it is, a little bit of irregularity means that a person touched this, right? It's not a perfect bit, uh, a perfect ellipse. It does, and it then, does so have a, like a harmonizing effect with the rest of your, your drawing aesthetic. Because if you do, if, I mean, what, one option it would be like just using a, a perfect rectangle or a perfect uh, a rectangle with rounded corners, which mm -hmm. some comics do, but that has um, that has an effect on on like these letters don't necessarily integrate aesthetically as much with the um, the art. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, you seem to to have this balance of clean mixed with um expressive oh, that's i that that's i think that's a fair way of describing it yeah um and so once i've got this drawn or once once you get your balloon actually drawn a neat thing that clip studio paint does that it, for better or worse i mean for if you're doing print on demand if you're doing your own um you know, home printed comics, this is perfect. But what, if you start working for a publisher, I found out with Rockets, you can't submit your lettering this way. We had to use Adobe Illustrator because of the way that they did their offset printing. But if you look in the layer palette, the text layer that says, don't tell me that was not quite almost ever so nearly not bad, it, the layer is named that text, but it has this little icon next to it with it has the little uh, balloons and a little cube indicating that you can now modify this with this tool here called the operation tool. And it automatically links the text to the balloon, but I can move the text out of the balloon if I want. With the operation tool, I can move the text around, get it as centered as I want inside the balloon, but then I can also click on the balloon and move them both around as a unit. And if I change the shape of the balloon, it keeps the relative position of the text in that balloon. That's so, so powerful. That is such a Clip Studio Paint thing. Yeah, it really makes your, your word balloon management um, a, a lot easier overall. Um, I compared to working in Illustrator and Photoshop and having to switch back and forth, maybe that's changed. I haven't used the new Creative Cloud stuff, so maybe they've like changed it a little bit, but mm. it made uh, that kind of management a little bit easier. But Not from really. oh, okay. <laughs> So once I've got the balloon drawn, now it's time to go back to my word balloon sub menus. And in here, there's balloon tail. And when you click on balloon tail uh, in the tool property menu underneath, you have a couple different options. You could do a straight line tail where you just click and drag to make a tail on the balloon. You can do a polyline, which is if you want to do like a radio voice kind of thing, you can click point, point, point and make jagged uh balloon tails or you have a spline which this one I click once I click once I click once and I start to make a curve and then double click to finish and I can make a curved tail and just like the text just like the balloon you can click on the tail as a separate object and you can change its shape and size move it around you can change the points on it so you do like a swervy balloon like if she's talking like a ghost right so it's very very editable and you can just hit delete to get rid of that tail if you don't like it, and then you can just make a new tail. And I'll follow what I originally did. Tighten that tail up. Now, something that I was talking with Greg Shegel recently about balloon design, and one thing that he reminded me of that I don't think I ever talk about in my classes, and I really should make more noise about this, is that it's generally speaking, like aesthetically pleasing, generally. Not everybody does this, but generally speaking, like the classic comics, the tail tended to emanate 
from what looks like the center of the balloon. So like when you if you finish the arc of that tail, it should it should end in the center of the balloon and the other end of the tail should generally speaking point towards the character's mouth. So it doesn't have to get that close to that's the character, so but just interesting. And in both cases, by having that that design choice, that's kind of using the Gestalt principle of closure, I would say, right? Where mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean you're you're essentially uh I mean yeah, I don't know, you're you're combining the the um the i don't know the, the beginning and the output the result uh mm -hmm. huh and and like it's less so theoretically that would be maybe a more knowable pattern because that's just a convention that a lot of um, art that is um, very re refined according to a structured set of rules easier to consume and all that huh and okay that's cool yeah well wow. so that that's that's you know, the first thing I do on the page is do all of these word balloons. So I will go ahead and place them all and then, you know, go on and do the next one and the next one until all of the word balloons are done. And then from there, I'll start to do my sound um, effects. And let's just do this crack it up top real quick. Um, so for that, I'll actually avail myself of layer folders because I'm going to use a lot of layer. Well, I'm going to use at least three layers for some of these sound effects. So I'm going to go, um, I'd make a first folder called SFX and I make a subfolder in there called Krakata. And I'm going to drop that into the sound effects folder. And now I'm going to make some layers. Now with this particular one, it has an outline to it. I'm going to do an outline with a fill inside of it and maybe do another outline out, outside of it. So um, to expedite this and to make this go as quickly as, as I can, I'm going to start with a vector layer. We've talked about vector layers before on the Linotart cast. It has special properties that are really fun to use. In that, I'm actually going to draw in ink, but it's going to be vector lines, but I'm hand drawing it. And I'll just go in and I'll just start to trace out the K. And notice that I'm overlapping all my lines because the neat thing about vector layers is I can go to my vector eraser in the eraser submenu and just drag over top of the where the intersections happen and it just deletes the points of intersection or to the point of intersection so that now I've got a nice clean K without the overlap. And also the reason I also use a vector uh, layer is because I could also go back down to that last tool on the menu where there's all those different sub tools that uh, affect um, vector lines, like I can correct the line width, I can redraw the vector line width. So if I want to change the width on that K, Gosh. I just drag my pen right over top of that and just Wouldn't use a little bit of pressure. The vector drawing plus the vector, the vector, vector drawing and vector erasing is the shut up and take my money feature for Clip Studio Paint. It was for me. Like I remember it was Stephen McCraney showed me this. And once I saw this, I was like, yep, I'm, I, pff, I'm, I'm buying it today. And then I went home and I bought it. <laughs> yeah. So, so, oh, and I got to name this layer. I'm going to call this one crack at outline one. Okay. So then I'm going to go through and, and, and I mean, because of that vector, uh, vector layer, I can just work really fast. And not have to worry about those overlaps and not so even much more energy in the lines because of that speed too. Yeah. Yeah. It reminds me of like how Krishna Sadasvam's lines look. They just like look so energized, right? There's just so much force behind them. And I, and because I can change the width, I don't even have to really focus on that much at this point on getting the width, right? Cause I can change that afterwards. Now I'm just Gosh, worried about getting the shape. I know about that one too. Like I, the, you, you pointed out something I did not know as far as the the, you know, the vector drawing. So, you, so not only can you put tons of energy, uh, have lines intersect, which lets you erase them easily, and then you can go, you can fix the weight, because that's something that can take a little fiddling, right? Yep. If you have yep. the, if you have good enough positioning and good enough like f energy or feel, um, the rest is easily adjusted. Yeah, so I mean, it, it lets me focus on what's important right now, and that's getting the letter shape right and getting the energy right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's like, I, I keep coming back to this idea of like, this chunking thing is like, can you reduce your amount of concerns to as few as possible for the immediate job, right? And then come back and fix it later, if you need to. Um, I, I, I find that very attractive. And it, it, it lets me, uh, you know, keep the cognitive load low when I'm doing this kind of stuff. 
All right, so I'm almost done drawing the Krakata. And notice I'm drawing the whole word, even though it's going to get covered up. That's fine, because I may wind up changing its position later. Um, so get the last ATA. I'm going to do kind of a sloppy job of it here, because I want to make sure that I don't eat up too much time with the demo. Oh, this is awesome. So um, what else, what can I comment on as far as the audio? Uh, besides <laughs> being essentially a, uh, a cheerful hype person for, uh, well, both your, your lettering approach and then the darn tool uh, Clip Studio Paint, which, you know, they're not a sponsor. No, they're not. They're and a sponsor, but. Well, and I also want to say about uh, Clip Studio Paint, I love this application. I've been using it for all my graphic novel work for like five years now. And I, I've been talking about it a lot over the years, although I do want to say out loud that their model they employed for the iPad release makes me nervous. Like the fact that if you want it on the iPad Pro, you have to pay a $10 monthly fee. And I'm just, it makes me nervous that they're going to do that with the desktop version. And I would pay it because I use it every day, but it's just, it would make me very sad to have to pay a monthly fee for my software. Um, I think there would be a way to essentially um, patch and care for your hardware to mm -hmm. maintain compatibility with um, you know, a version of it. Because, I mean, that's something I've, I've noticed recently if, um, you know, some folks I know will um, like to use an old printer they'll keep a, an even like a virtual machine around or, or a physical machine where it's like, yeah, that's that machine's job is, is it lets me use my old printer. Yeah. Because yeah. There's, there's so much forced obsolescence. And uh, I think some of it we don't have to um, be stuck with. Yeah. I actually have an old copy of CSP that is uh, saved in for that eventuality. <laughs> um, okay. So once I've got the letters drawn, now the next step is I'm going to make another layer underneath it called Krakata Fill. Krakata Fill, there we go. And then I'm going to go back to my um, vector layer. And I don't know if you remember this trick. I'm going to turn this into a reference layer. And what that does, it's this little lighthouse icon at the top of the um, layer palette. And what it does is it now says that like certain tools when set to interact with the reference layer are going to inter they're going to do stuff on the layer you have selected, but they're going to act like the stuff on the reference layer is on that layer. So it's kind of like how in Metabank Paint and Fire Alpaca, you can set the bucket to interact with all layers. Now you're being very selective about which layer it interacts with. So it's only going to interact with the Krakata outline layer and the layer I'm currently on, which is Krakata fill. And so I'm going to go to my paint bucket tool. And I'm going to choose, there's a bunch of different paint buckets nested in here. I'm going to choose the one that says refer other layers. I'm going to set it to refer to the reference layer. I'm going to set it to area scaling to one and turn it up turn on follow adjacent pixel so it doesn't just fill everything that's that color. And I'm going to change my color to white. I'm just going to drop in with the paint bucket into this. Actually, let me just do a color because it'll be easier to see. Mm, yeah, good idea. So let's just do red. And I'm just going to tap inside of each of these letters and it fills. And because I also had this set to, there's another option in here. Um, where close is gap. it? Not close gap. It's... Um, Anti-aliasing ink. Where is it? There's an option to. Um, oh, oh! They changed the 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 wording on this with this update. Fill up to vector path, which means that it is when I let me go to this these lines. When I hover over these vector lines, let me go to one that's not red. You can see that because it's vector, um, I can move these Bezier points on these lines that are hand drawn. So you can be like really fussy with it if you want. But what that also means is the vector lines in the dead center of your ink line. And so when I take that paint bucket tool and click on it, because it said fill to the center line of vector, it's giving me a perfect fill underneath these. So it's filled. It's like the, the fill extends out to halfway through the line like you'd want it to. Okay. Now let's do the outline. So now I've got this part done. Now I'm going to make one more layer, and I'm going to call this one Krakata Outline 2. 
And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to control click or command click, depending on which system you're using on, on crack it a fill on the layer, little layer preview, which makes a selection out of everything that's on that layer. And then I'm going to shift control click on the crack it outline one layer. And so now I've made a selection of both the outline and the fill, right? And when you make a selection in Clip Studio Paint, you get this little menu that drops in underneath your selection. And there's a lot of different options here. You can deselect, if you, you can invert the selection, but this is the one we want is expand selected area. I'm gonna click that, tell it to expand by, let's say, yeah, six pixels is fine. Hit okay. And now we can see the marching ants have made a wider path around the lettering. And I'm gonna choose a different color. Let's choose an orange. And I'm gonna go making sure I'm on crack it outline too. I'm gonna hit fill. And now we've got an outline, a fill, and another outline on top of that. And let's let's change the colors really quick. So now that I've got these fills done, I'm gonna go ahead and lock transparent pixels, which is another option in the menu, uh, the layer menu, and the, in the middle middle right. It's a little lock icon with a checkered box next to it. And what that does is, as we know, you know, when you lock transparent pixels, that means you can't draw on that layer except in areas where there's already color. So I'm gonna choose like a bright orange, grab my gradient tool, and I'm gonna set a click and drag right in the middle of that. And I'm gonna put a little bit of a gradient in there. Or actually, you know, I'm gonna think about where is the high point of the sound? Crack it up, crack it up, crack it up. It's in that first A. That's where the accent is. And so I'm gonna actually put the gradient there, okay? And then I'm gonna go to gradient outline two, get a nice bright yellow, do the same thing there. And then I'm gonna to go to crack it outline one. Now on a vector layer, you cannot change the color of the ink as easily. So I'm gonna make a clipping path or a clipping layer above that, make a new layer, call this one crack it This is why I'm using folders, by the way, outline one or outline holds for color holds. And for that, I'm gonna to go to like a nice dark red and I'm gonna turn this layer into a clipping layer, which is that little hamburger icon right next to the lighthouse. And what that does is it puts a little red line next to that layer that says, this layer will now only interact with stuff that's immediately below it. So when I hit the paint bucket tool up at the top of menu here, it automatically fills that line with all, if I turn off the clipping layer, it's, I just filled everything with the dark red. When I turn on the clipping layer, it just only has that red interact with the black lines underneath it. And I could, even do, I could even do a gradient on that if I want and really, you know, sell the impact of it. Um, but because I have transparent pixels locked on these, I could also go in with say like a watercolor brush. I can grab a neat watercolor brush and choose like a dark orange of some sort and just scrub around to create some texture on this. I don't know if that's even showing up or even better, I could do this. I can go into, I have a folder of brushes and textures. I'm gonna open that up. I'm gonna grab like, let's grab like, I have uh, some watercolor paper. Mm. I'm gonna copy that, com uh, Commander Control C, go back to this, go above uh, my crack at a folder, I'm gonna paste it, there's my watercolor, turn that into a clipping layer. Oh, actually I have to do that over the fill. And so that's now a clipping layer, so if I move that watercolor around, you'll only see it where there's already stuff, right? Transform it, grow it a little bit. And then and I'm going to set this layers mode with the layer mode uh, button at the top of the layer palette to overlay. And if we look closely, it's kind of hard to see. Let me turn it to multiply. It darkens it a bit, but now you can see that it adds like a little bit of a texture. I can turn the transparency up or down have it interact. Yeah, the color's not flat anymore. It's it's not flat color. Mm, yeah. yeah. It's like a paper texture. And then one might say, so I can close my, you know, toggle my folder closed. And it wants to say, well, how are you going to visually integrate this so that the characters overlap? Well, now at the bottom right of the layer palette, you have this little, it's sort of like a rectangle with a circle in the middle of it. And it says create layer mask. I'm going to tap that. And now next to the folder, icon in the layer palette, we get this big white box that that indicates this is now a, a mask that you can interact with with your pens. So I'm going to go in with my paintbrush or my eraser, actually eraser, and I'm going to start erasing 
the places where it overlaps with the art. Now, normally I would wait until I've got the inking done to do this, but I'm just showing you this to see, show you how it works. And I'm not actually erasing the art at all because if I turn off, if I turn off the mask, that art is still there. I'm just hiding it, right? And so, and I'm just editing the mask, making sure that I've got that white box selected in the layer palette. I'm interacting with it with my pen and uh, eraser tools to, to put it behind the artwork like I originally had in the thumbnails, right? Oops, there we go. And then we have the sound fully integrated into the art, as it were. So any thoughts, questions, wonderings? Uh, anybody saying anything in the chat about this? Uh, just just a little thought from uh, Shadowing Tronics that uh, it's a commenting that uh, this is this approach uh, is um, Clip Studio Paint and the vector vector lines and all that stuff. It, it's a really helpful tool for coloring in general. And uh, yeah, it is yeah, speeds up flatting that kind of thing. It's I mean, it's a specialist tool, right? It's it has general capabilities like they, they try to like on the iPad, they try to sell it where, it, you know, you launch it in I forget which two modes, but one mode is, is like it's the it's the, it's got all the features and it it's, looks like the desktop app for the most part, some, some tweaks for the tablet UI, uh, like the full time tablet, tablet only UI, right? Mm -hmm. Where um, uh, so it, it's a few design changes for, for that, but like, um, you know, they try to simplify it and claim it's a, it's a general purpose tool in a way, right? Capture, you know, have more people, more, more subscriptions, what have you. And, but honestly, in its heart, it's a, it's, it's an app really meant for people who make uh, comics and want to do mm -hmm. lettering and things like that. Like Photoshop can do this stuff. Um, Illustrator can do this stuff. And, and it's, each of them has these, um, they, they don't have these speed boosts that, that are like very knowing about the jobs that you do, especially like all that word balloon stuff. It's, it's awesome. Mm -hmm. And it yeah, really, it's really does great. help. So, um, yeah. Quick, quick final thought mentions. before. What's up? Quick final thought before we move on to the next section. So like, you know, I just want to draw people's attention to the fact that, okay, so here's like how I, the, the crack at a sound effect looked in the final version. Mm -hmm. Right, and we in this comic was black and white, so didn't have a lot of options when, with, when it comes to color. But I do think about texture too. So, like, if we look at the original thumb mm. when this giant spider head hits the ground, it's THM, which I've got a whole philosophy on when it comes to like the onomatopoeia, which we'll talk about later. Um, I used a block letter here, but then when I've thought about like the the sound of this thing hitting this dirt floor, I thought it should have like a grittier noise to it. And so I used this is one of the reasons I hand draw these in Clip Studio Paint is because there's all these wonderful brushes you can use, uh, especially if you go to Ray Frendon's website, frendon.com, you can get awesome brushes from him. And this is one of his ink, uh, textured ink brushes. And so I literally just hand drew THM. And then I did the same thing where I selected uh, you know, command clicked on the uh, on the layer, expanded the selection, filled it in white on a layer below to create the white outline, right? And choosing black for the fill instead of white. So instead of being a white sound with a black outline, I thought, well, this is like a big, heavy sound that doesn't reverberate. Bright colors tend to reverberate in my mind. Dark colors tend to not echo, right? So, which is why when we have the characters laughing, it's a brighter sound, right? Versus the sound of a giant metal thing crashing into a dirt floor. So things I think about when I do this stuff. Um, so. Uh, so one more time for one more mm -hmm. uh, question. So Shadowing okay. Tronics asks in the chat, uh, how do you install a new brush? How, oh, actually, it's a lot easier than it used to be. So I'll show you how you install a new brush. Um, so you open up your brush palette and it's it's really simple to make so when i open up my brushes here you can see that i've got one two three four five six seven eight nine different collections of brushes that i switch between so like here's my basic uh clip studio paint pen brushes here's a bunch of my friend and brushes i bought and th this is a collection i bought from him called uh his dry brush pack which i use a lot as a matter of fact i modified one of the brushes of his to make a wet brush out of a dry brush and that's this is like my main inking brush that i use now um but to, to install them 
all you need to do is you open up, you, once you've downloaded the brushes, I'm gonna go to my comics, uh, brushes and textures, and here's, not my brushes for layer paint, I want my friend in brushes. So here's the, the actual brushes that I that you download from him, and you just like with your finder window open, click and drag it over into the folder, and there it is. Now it's there. And if you want to turn this into its own collection, like let's say I'm gonna make a grease pencil collection, I just drag that pen up here and it automatically creates, okay, here's a new collection starting with that brush. Right. So that's really cool. Didn't know about it's, that. It's really simple. It used to be a lot harder to load brushes, but you can, and you can actually um, grab like say 10, 20 brushes at a go and just drag them in like that. And it'll, it'll take a minute, but it'll, uh, it'll get them all in there. So, so yeah. And then you can, you can duplicate brushes and customize them by going to the little wrench icon at the bottom of the tool property menu. You can change like the ink flow. You can change, um, the brush shape, you can, you know, make this brush more of a spray brush or give it like a pattern, um, change the stroke, the texture. You can actually install um, from your, uh, what's it called? This is your materials menu. You can install different textures to the brushes as I'm scrolling through these, you can see. So yeah, making custom brushes is actually pretty simple. Um, it's just, it, it takes a little bit of finagling and it takes, it's a little time consuming, but also if you get, um, not clip studio paint, but clip studio, um, which is their sort of like portal website app, you can download a whole bunch of free brushes from there too. And I think they get auto installed into your instance of clip studio paint. So that's another one to look at too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, their, their cloud is, is interesting. It's, um, I wouldn't say it's the most shining greatest part of the app, but it, um, yeah. but it, it can, you can synchronize and, and get file. That's one way to get files from, for instance, you know, your different versions, if you have it on Mac or windows or iPad, what have you. So it's, um, yeah. And of course your other settings, right? So if you put a lot of work into the settings, you want your, 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 um, uh, you know, more familiar arrangements of, of your palettes and stuff. Yeah, it's, it, it helps for that. Kind of, well, I mean, just like creative cloud. And I mean, that's one of the features that um, Adobe has is synchronizing, you know, a variety of things, fonts, mm -hmm. palettes, workspaces. Yeah. So what do you think? Yeah. I mean, yes, it's, I, I don't use it a ton, but it's, yeah, go ahead. Oh, I, I was I was thinking that uh, this was an awesome demo jersey, and it'd be neat to um, to dig into your uh, your <laughs> it's, get into your 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 mind. Can we see like the jersey predator vision or the AR view? Right. I mean, <laughs> right. So like the the movie of um, you know the old old Arnold Schwarzenegger movie Predator, right? The, or the I'm sure it's been remade and stuff, whatever. But I I don't pay attention to new media. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, the idea where it's like, you look at this, the tools and you have a different set of I ideas and expectations. You look at the, how you mapped out your, your, um, I mean, I mean, it's, I mean, obviously starts at the thumbnail phase when you're doing all this problem solving. I, anything we can do to, to see into that, I think would be great. And of course okay. there is always that awesome workshop for Tam which goes yeah. into lots of depth. Which go, it, I, I forget how long the workshop is, but it's it's it's, it's over multiple hours. hours. Okay, it's over four hours of me like spent. Yes, I, I dig deep on like my the, the the four or five realms of concern that I navigate when I'm designing sound elements and word balloons in my comics. And we'll, we'll I'll, I'll, I'm going to breeze over it. them quickly. Yeah, the, it, it's it, like in, the um, it's like the Lord of the Rings for um, for sound <laughs> design, right? And, and, and this is awesome. We, we need to expound, expound upon this metaphor over time where there are uh -huh. realms of concern and, uh, and multiple <laughs> adventures. So, and it's epic. The realms, the realms of concern. Yeah, that should be like a mystical place in, in one of our books. You must embark upon the realms of concern or cross the realms of concern to get to the, the, the land of consideration. Okay, uh, in a minute and a half, we're going to talk about, you know, what what four things I think about, five, four or five things I think about and trade off back and forth between when I'm doing my sound designs and word balloon designs. But before we do that, we got to thank some people who make this show possible. Those people happen to be the folks who support us on Patreon. Yes, 
patreon.com slash lean into art is the website what is it it's a way for you to give us an up uh, monthly upvote you say i believe in jersey and rob i believe in the work that they do and i want to help make the show more sustainable by donating as little as a dollar a month and you can cancel it at any time uh so you could just come in and just do like a one-time you know contribution and then avail yourself of all the extra content there and then take off and that would be a, a, a very kind thank you to us and i want to thank five people who've been contributing on a monthly basis for some time now. Brandon Dayton. You can find Brandon Dayton on Twitter at Brandon Dayton. Thank you, Brandon. And Jesse Kaufman, longtime friend of the show, been on the show before. You can find Jesse on Twitter at Jesse Kaufman, K-A-U-F-F-M-A-N. Also, Becca Hilburn, another longtime supporter. Thank you, Becca, for believing in us and what we do. You can find Becca on Twitter at Natto Soup. Also, Nathan Seabolt. Thank you, Nathan. It means a lot to us. You can find Nathan on Twitter at N underscore Seabolt. And finally, Ben Odgren. Thank you, Ben. You can find Ben on Twitter at Ben Odgren. And you can join them all at patreon.com slash lean into art, where you will find all the shows we make, as well as the extra leans, the shows we record only for people who support us on Patreon. Those posts are just, it's an extra show that's special for those people, but then the, those posts become an open mic thread where you can talk about whatever you want in a safe place with fellow leaners. Once again, patreon.com slash lean into art. Thank you so much, everybody, for supporting us there. It means a lot to us. It really does. It's awesome. Thank you. All right. Let me get some music. Uh, I have a track here from the Transformer soundtrack called Ancient Wisdom. Apparently, this is the sound of Ancient Wisdom. It sounds like an old synth, right? <laughs> yeah. I guess, it's, I guess that would be considered ancient by today's standards, right? Yeah. It's... Um... Yeah, that's that synth has seen some things, and um, <laughs> yeah. But uh, okay, it's funny. I actually I really like old synths. I have a I have an ancient one. I have a what is it a Kwai K four R, um, and it's yeah that thing's a tank. It's <laughs> it's it's moved and lived with me for over twenty years. And when I got it, it was a few years old. Got it used at Computer wow. Center. Anyway. It makes delightful sounds a lot like um, this, the interstitial. Yeah, it's it's a it's it's a, like John Carpenter synth it has like a very unique sound that like I and and actually you know I remember doing a Saturday Supercast like almost ten years ago about He Man and the Masters of the Universe and we got into a, a discussion about the soundtrack which is mostly synth and I was like you know I know it sounds cheesy by modern ears but it really makes the thing feel more otherworldly to me. Like, than if you had done like a big orchestra, right? So anyway, it does. I would say one of the one of a super awesome place for that. Sorry to just keep adding adding to the tangent. <laughs> um, one more tangent, brick, is um, playing the original Mass Effect video game. They played mm. into that feel in the soundtrack so well, and yeah. it's that that combination of of um, maybe when that media was becoming popular in mass and then the sounds that were associated with it and that they they really tried to convey the future with those the with the synths oh yeah and like this. the wendy carlos tron soundtrack i don't know if you, when last time you sat down and listened to that but that is fantastic the original one no i, I haven't yeah I've, I've heard the the second one more of, of the second one is great too but yeah, yeah I, I have a lot of fondness for the the original oh, soundtrack I, I gotta check it out again all right it's very of its time wendy but carlos? it's it yeah okay cool um, okay, so breaking down the four design constraints of sound design. Um, so, okay, so this is the way I break it down in my classrooms. And I think this is, this is by no means, um, well, maybe it's, maybe it's like a recipe. I tend to do it in this order, but I think it happens sort of like almost instantaneously for me now. Like the, 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 the I oscillate between the four concerns constantly while I'm in the process of designing the sound. So like sometimes I, th I think I'll have like the shape nailed, but now nah, I gotta go back and touch it a few more times to get that shape nailed. Anyway, the first the first step as I think of it is the onomatopoeia. So for instance, you when you had this like giant metallic body falling to the ground, you have that thum sound um, because I tend to think that sounds with vowels reverberate sounds that don't echo, don't have vowels. So for instance, the um, classic 
punch sound effect in the Indiana Jones movies by Ben Burt, where it's a very specific kind of like over the top punch noise. Um, it doesn't echo. It's a very deep and thick and meaty sound. So it'd be T H D S H, a thrish, right? In my, if I were designing the sound, it, that's the onomatopoeia I would choose. Whereas if something is like an oil tanker is exploding, that's gonna that sound is gonna echo for a long way, and it might be like a thrack and a boom, something like that. But there's gonna be a lot of vowels in it. So vowels, in my mind, tend to equal reverberation, sound that carries, sound that echoes. Uh, lack of vowels tends to indicate a sound of like dropping a bowling ball on concrete. It's gonna have like a thunk, and it's just gonna that sound is just gonna die right there, right? Um, so that's one of my first steps is like figure out, I, I'll sound it out with my mouth. I'll make the sound in my studio and I will, you know, work it out. Like what, what kind of, how would your mouth make that sound? And that's how I arrive at the spelling. Okay. And then once that's, once that's arrived at, then I go, okay, well, what would be the shape of the letters? What would, what would be the shape of the letter form is to communicate the thickness, thinness, shrillness, tinniness, uh, high pitch, low pitch, what what are the characteristics of that sound and how does shape correspond to that? So if it's a thunk of a bowling ball flying into concrete, maybe I'm going to use like a thick block letter because it's a thick sound, but it's, it's a dead sound. I'm not going to use a wavy line. I'm going to use like very smooth lines, maybe even like just pure like sports block letters, right? Um, but if it's something like electricity, I might use like a jagged line. I might use, and if it's, there's different kinds of electricity. So it's like, like there's like a, a power station electricity, right? Like the mains are on kind of power, uh, high tension wires kind of hum, like the big, like thick hum of a electric uh, power station versus say, um, I don't know, like a taser, right? Getting zapped to the taser, which could be a thin, more trilly sound. And it might have a thinner letter form with a wavy line on it, right? Um, falling into say like a stunt man falling into one of those giant air cushions off of a building right the poof kind of sound that you would get from that well maybe i'm going to use like a smoother softer shape to indicate like the quality of the air and the the softness of the the sound itself it doesn't it's not piercing right it's a it's 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 an airy sound um so first you got onomatopoeia then you've got letter shape and or font right um then the next one, and this is where it gets weird, is what color is that sound? Now, the example I use in my classrooms a lot is like, what's the sound of a lightsaber? Well, it's vroom, 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 it's and you know, it's like, you make all those different noises with your mouth and then you arrive at some spellings. Then we arrive at some letter shapes, like, well, if I use this big puffy line to indicate that, sh that sound, oh, that doesn't feel right. Well, what if I use a more electrical looking sound? Ah, that looks right. Now, what color is that sound? Well, if it's a red lightsaber, it'd be a red sound. If it's a blue lightsaber, it'd be a blue sound. Well, maybe, maybe that would more visually integrate with the piece, but let's back up and look at this even more abstractly. If you have somebody's boot heel crushing a soda can, right? And we can picture that sound in our head. We can hear that, right? So we come up with the, the crunkle, crinkle, the crunkle, crunkle, crunkle sound design of the onomatopoeia. And then we come up with maybe the letter forms that look like that, that quality of sound, but what's the color of the sound of a can being crushed, right? Now I have some shorthand that I use for this for myself is that I tend to think brighter colors are higher frequency, darker colors are lower frequency. Uh, more so like warmer colors tend to go towards more higher frequency, cooler colors tend to go through lower frequency. So like, for instance, what do I mean? If I say um, the oil tanker's exploding, generally speaking, if I, and I've done this in a lot of different classrooms, generally speaking, we're to say, oh, it's gonna be like a red or an orange. And I'll say, well, well, okay, but maybe because we're thinking of the fire, but like, what if I say like clapping hands? If I, we all start clapping, what color is that sound? Well, that's a yellow sound, invariably, right? There's gonna be differences because this is not, at least my approach to this is not academic and scientific, right? But I'm just doing anecdotal evidence by, by practicing with students for the last 11 years. Um, and so, yes, higher frequency, more, more um, piercing noises tend to be brighter colors, and or warmer colors. But if I were to say that bowling ball on the concrete, well, that's gonna be like a gray or a dark blue, right? That's, again, that's a rule of thumb that I just use for my own designs, right? Um, and then the final the final tool, so those are like, you know, those are three things to think about. Fourth thing is I think is uh, compositional integra integration. How do I integrate the sound into the drawing, 
right? So this probably happens earlier on than the other concerns in that I do this at the thumbnail level. Where's the sound effect going to happen? Um, how do I place the sound effect so that it directs the reader's eye in the way that I hope that it will go? How can I make it look like that the sound is actually there in that space without interfering with the art? So in the example of the girl punching the spider's head off, okay, it's a big sound because it's a big dramatic moment in the story. And also it's like her, this girl, like doing this really awesome physical thing to deal with a threat. Um, so it should have like a, a lot of oomph and it should take up a lot of space, but I don't want to cover up the cool action. Let's have it happen in the background so that we know that the sound is there, but we don't have to like necessarily, it's, it's there and it's not there at the same time. And it's not interfering with the flow of visual information, but it's making its presence very well known, right? That's the kind of back and forth that I'm thinking about when I'm thinking about visual integration into the piece as well. So if I go back to just real quick, that Instagram post, like one of the things I'm thinking about when I take away all of the actual artwork on the page and just look at the flow of the sounds, right? Look at the directions that they're going, right? So there's like a visual flow to that too. So, whoops trying to scroll and like you can see like the different letter forms and shapes that I'm using. So like this hiss sound, I wanted it to be an airy sound, but I still wanted it to be kind of a creepy sound. So I used like a wavy line and it, it, you can't see it in this photo, but I actually put kind of like a, a, a rough edge on the left side of all the letters. So like that it's like, it's, it has, I wanted to put like a visual sizzle on it. Um, and then this, this shree here, I wanted it to be, you know, like ear piercing. I want it to be like, you know, like when you're at like a concert or something and the sound gets to that level where you hear like almost like a crackle in your eardrums. I want it to have that kind of quality to it. So again, the rough edges on it. Um, the clong is a metal on metal sound. So I chose like nice, big, bold, uh, squarish letters with smooth shapes. So. Wow. So I threw a lot at you, I'm sorry. You, no, you did. You did, but I've you know, we've uh, I've been around your your thoughts on this for a number of years, and it occurs to me, a few things a few new things occur to me hearing you share this. First of all, it's like this is um, you did a bunch of spell casting because basically there's like five words in the show notes, and you're like, boom, <laughs> here's a bunch of thoughts. It's awesome, and it's it's quite a system, and it it really reminds me, it. I think that maybe another angle on a class or something, I don't know, food for thought, unrequested from, from you. But, but one of my reactions is that in a way you have your own, um, you think of it as like a style guide, right? Um, mm -hmm. That is how you express sound. And, you know, there are different house styles. And I think you have such a well arranged systematized approach to um visualizing uh sound it's a it's a system that you could prompt others to come up with their own house styles oh wow that would be a neat class what is yeah. your house style like what's what's your what's your philosophy and what are your uh because like i again going back to that lightsaber example I could see the argument and I think it's a valid argument to say like, no, you, you would use blue because that visually integrates better with the page. And I'm not thinking so much about how color represents sound quality as much as color represents the aesthetics in this page. Or you might even well, say that about the letter There's a the bunch of things. You have flow, you've got priority over space and time. You've got the relationships among the sound and the other elements. And then, and, and that is interweaving with your uh, idea of the core onomatopoeia, onomatopoeia uh, letter shape, color, and composition, and the the vocabulary. You have a bunch of vocabulary prompts where I think other people would answer that differently because the emotions they feel about the sounds they hear are mm -hmm. going to have a different um, relationship, right? Yeah, like, yeah. Everything goes through a guitar pedal in my brain. Everything. Interesting. And, yeah, and uh, that is this touchstone for me, but then relating that to your sort of walkthrough of a zoo of sound possibilities. And yeah. it's, it's, it's fascinating. And I think it's very useful. Just your house style. It's awesome. It's like using a framework 
where you say, well, like, I want to make a website or, you know, I'm going to use this, this approach. And boy, did they think of a lot of things. Phew, I don't have to think of those things. Um, <laughs> I just can make sure that maybe I'm using it well, right? So I need to think yeah. about them enough to use this codified approach well, but I don't have to think as deep about it. I'm a user of an approach and a framework, not necessarily a creator of it, who is then... Uh, playing jazz with it and expanding and testing and all the stuff all the time, improvising. Uh, but Going back to your work. guitar pedal example, like I, I guess if you were in my class, the thing I would say to you after getting that prompt from you is I would say, okay, well, what would the letter forms be for say Iron Maiden bass versus Faith No More bass, right? Oh, it's like, sure. is it, I bet you could picture that in your head, like the, the, the very, yeah, very fine like, differences boom, between those boom boom blip for faith no more and iron maiden is like brr, 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 right brr, brr, brr. <laughs> <laughs> but like what shapes would those sounds take right yeah versus like because um, like because also faith no more tends to be a little bit more crunchy than iron maiden iron maiden is like it's like rippling water in the background mm -hmm. versus say like something that's like kind of like hitting a hammer on a thing almost mm-hmm well, I think, I, and I think, like you're like you're showing right now, like that, it, it would be interesting for you to facilitate that uh, out of others, others' experiences who want to visually express sound, but maybe they hear it a little bit different. And I think a lot of folks would just love to just you know again, you know, pick up your current Fatam course or or you know, in in related things you've shared that um, where essentially you're building off of the your framework where you've you've interpreted very intentionally so many areas areas of concern of of a, the information in sound and the feeling of sound to then visualize it um so yeah uh, what i love about that idea is is that it's it would be explicitly designed to help people develop their own toolkit rather than here's like an out of the box set of things here's your wix.com site for doing sound design, right? Uh, mm -hmm. But instead saying like, oh, here's how you build your own Wix.com site or your own toolkit so that you have, you know, a thoughtful set of parameters for you to develop. Like, I, I like the, the term house style, but I but like, how do you expand on that to make it even more clear so that it's like, this is meant to get you to think hard about this so that by the end you have yourself a, your own a sound, sound design code. Framework. And yeah. it's, a, it's a sound visualization framework which is a system of expressing sound visually. So yeah, that, that's a neat idea. And so that what that does, it lets you express it consistently. And so even though it's got, it'll have its own flavor and feel um, different than others house styles, but that is potentially welcome because it's more, it's, it's like another angle of someone else's creative voice. Yeah. So, I think that's I think that's a, a great final line on this section is that this is an angle of your creative voice, and I think that like anything, it should be thoughtfully employed. The example I use in my classroom is like I get a little sad when I'm reading a comic and somebody takes just like a block font, writes out blam, writes out kabloom or whatever, and just turns it a little bit at an angle, makes it red, and goes like I'm done. I did my job. And I'm like, well, yeah, you, I guess you did. You know, but it's like it's like it's like saying like I cleaned the table and you just like ran a rag over it once. You know, you didn't. Did you really clean it? <laughs> Is it disinfected? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I I've left many a dirty comic table, and uh, oh no, I want to do better. Same here, man. Same here. Um, but you know, like one of the first conversations I had with Dan Michigan was how bad my word balloon uh, placement was, and when he pointed out, I was heartbroken, but I was also like like sort of like elevated right i'm like oh now i can now i know how to make it even better um wait you give me some good food for thought and i guess i will put it to the leaners i would love to hear from people who are actually interested in that idea um and i guess maybe you could vote even by downloading the fatam workshop which we'll talk about in a minute um when we get to our final ad break is there anything that that like seems like a final thought in what we've been talking about today i am really curious this doesn't have to be final thought, but like, what in the world got you down this rabbit hole of, of sound? And, uh, and I mean, you really, you went on your, this is the Lord of the Rings of <laughs> Jersey sound visualization. And 
I, I don't know, like, how did that, how did that start? And then how did you dig deeper? Mm. Is that a? Sure. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I can point at some things that I, I thought were inspirational sources for sure. Um, okay. We'll do that in, in about a minute and a half, two minutes. But before we do that, we got to take one more break to thank some people who made this show possible. And those people happen to be us. We make stuff. We work hard on the stuff, we think hard about this stuff, and then we bring these thoughts to the Lean Into Art cast. And the thing that I thought really hard about that I hope you will check out today, if you have not already, is Science Comics Rockets, Defying Gravity from First Second Books in stores everywhere. Uh, and what is it is the history and science of rockets is told by the animals who participated in rocket history. So you learn about like where rockets came from, uh, how they work, and you learn all these interesting stories of how animals were involved along the way, like true stories of animals in rocket history, like bears being used in ejector seat technology, rats being affixed with parachutes in order to advertise a fireworks manufacturer in the 1800s, um, tortoises, uh, flying to the moon and making it safely back to earth um, and more things like that, but also learning the, the basic fundamental physics of rockets. So it's, it's, it's a, it's an interesting story, whether or not you're, you are a, a space enthusiast and, but if you do like space travel and if you do like animals, this is the perfect book for you. It's also, in my opinion, the funniest thing with my name on it. It's, it's a truly funny book. Um, and you can find out more about it at science comics rockets dot Com. Also, it's in the bio of virtually every social media account that I have right now. So you can also find it there. Rob, what do you want to talk about this week? Well, I, I think it'd be great to share uh, another podcast I do called mm. Art and Science Punks. And uh, yeah, this is a this is a show that I that I it, it's it's something that I, I I've been wanting to do and have been doing this collaboration with my wife uh, Kate Shield Stenzinger, and and it's just this fun exploration of how we like to try to just just try stuff related to creative projects and related to learning and, and science and we you know both kate and i are, are excited about that for our own individual exploration but then well we have kids and that they they're a, they're a big catalyst where we want to be you know just living and learning and, and sharing stuff together with them and we try a lot of things and the that's this in a way this is a documentation of our story of we like we try a lot of stuff and we and we think about the the science angle of it too and we we were into the and it's you know why are we punks well it's it's like this it's an open invitation of do it yourself right let's um let's try stuff and uh have fun laughing about when it uh, goes right or wrong so that's at uh art science punks dot fireside dot fm and if you have if you have downloaded it and listened to it and if you enjoyed it i highly recommend that you give it a review wherever you listen to it that helps more people find it um if you are here because you like the way we think about stuff and you're not so much interested in the other stuff that we make fair enough this show is a thing that we make and you can find more things like it at leanintoart.com slash workshops this is where you could find the fatam lettering workshop which is mostly geared towards using adobe illustrator but the principles and the techniques in there can be applied to just about any graphic editing program and uh troy shadowing tronics in the chat even says he says even using fonts you can do things to make them look good like editing an image sound effects are like logos it's drawing with letters not just writing letters and that is i agree with that 100 percent that is exactly the kind of thing we talk about in the fatam workshop you can download it at a price of your choosing even free you can get it for free. All the workshops there you can get for free. But if you get some value out of it, a really neat thing you could do is then purchase it for a friend. And, and then you're, help, you're getting a gift for a friend and you're giving us a tip for making this thing that you found to be useful. And we thank everybody who's been doing those things. If you have uh, a free thing you could do is uh, if you're watching the video on YouTube right now, give it a thumbs up. That helps more people find the show. And if you are listening to the show in a podcast uh, app, or on one of those platforms like uh, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, giving us a five-star review helps more people find the show too. And thanks to everybody who has been doing that. It means a lot to us. Yeah, it really does. It's always great to hear. Um, let's uh, let's see. What 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 do you think, Jersey, about... Um, what what know, sent me down this road? Yeah, what sent you, sent you down this road? And then there must have been this... Uh, you know, like you looking into the depths of it and you were like, yeah, whatever, I'm going, you jumped in. 
Um, well, so I went back, so I recently moved as you know, we've chronicled on the show. And in that move, I had to go through a lot of stuff. And I went through a lot of old artwork, like dating back to as far as 1998. So quite, quite old artwork. And uh, when I was first starting out, and even on those pages, which when I was doing all the lettering on the boards, I was really working at integrating the sound elements. I wasn't doing a really awesome job of it, but you could tell that I was think at least beginning to think about it. And so I, that got me wondering, you know, like, okay, because I know I can name some instances of influences that came along after that, but like, what was influencing me then? And I have to say it was probably the work of John Workman. Now, John Workman is a letterer who most often works with Walt Simonson. Um, and Walt Simonson being one of my favorite artists of all time, one of the true genius storytellers of comics, of action adventure comics at any rate. Um, big, powerful stuff. I don't know if you've ever read his Thor comics, Rob, but I think you in particular of all my friends would really appreciate his approach to Thor because it's all about like just how awesome the human form looks when it's being like, when it's expressing itself through like, like you know, doing big things like just powerful motion. And when, when Mjolnir the hammer smashes something in a, in a Simonson comic, it's, it's, it's almost like it's beyond reality. It's like, it's like the stuff of dream. Like when you watch Thor Ragnarok, it's like, it's pretty cool, but honest and for true as much as good as that movie is, it ain't no Simonson comic. Simonson comics are better than the movies. Um, and John Workman, really contributes a lot to Simonson's pages. He thinks really hard about the onomatopoeia. He thinks about the sound integration. He was one of the first people I ever saw who does this neat trick where if a balloon is straddling two panels, he'll knock out the lines on the balloon where it's touching the gutter. Um, it's just, just, it's that little tiny touch that just makes it feel that much more integrated into the page. Um, and so I think when I was 18, 19, 20, I was, aping what Workman was doing without knowing what I was really aping. Cause that's how you start, right? You start by imitating things that you're responding to. Um, and then of course, Scott McCloud's understanding comics comes along when I'm like 20, 21. And he starts talking about how lines work and how like jagged lines make us feel, make us feel one way and like smooth lines make us feel another way. And I'm like, Oh my gosh, you're absolutely right. And I started thinking about that in terms of like how I design my word balloons, how I design my sound design. And as a matter of fact, you can see like in, in like 1996 in my, my mini comics I was doing at the time, all my word balloons had jagged lines on them because I wanted it to have like this rough gritty feel to it for some reason. <laughs> oh, um, and then I think it finally coalesced into like a deep dive. I, I want to say, when, when did the Star Wars special edition DVDs come out? whatever year those came out, I want to say like 2004, 2005, somewhere in the neighborhood. Um, and I listened to the audio commentary with Ben Burt, the sound designer on Star Wars. And when I heard that guy th talking about how hard he thinks about sound quality and tone and timber and pitch and how to, and how they mean different things to an audience and how in certain instances, a larger than life sound is what's necessary. In other instances, a very like mellow and more inobtrusive sound is necessary in order to create the, the texture and feeling of the scene. And uh, it was just so fascinating to listen to him and how he thought about it. I was like, okay, I, I clearly need to think more about my sound design of my comics. I want everything in my comics to be as thoughtful as that. Now, they're not. <laughs> because <laughs> you can only give so many mental cycles to the work without driving yourself bonkers. But I decided to pick my battles and there's certain things that I get very worked up about and sound design happens to be one of them. Um, I haven't sat down and done, done a list of like things in comics that I get insufferable about, but that would be like a, a high one on the list. Um, so yeah, so that's, that's where that, that, that's my journey into in relationship with, that the subject in a nutshell in a sort of a very very cliff's notes version but i would say anybody who is um is interested in this topic after hearing this episode i would say john workman is a good first place to start he i mean it's all big powerful stuff it's very superhero -y stuff but it's very thoughtfully done and I, I and I kid you not, his balloon tails just send me. Like I, I wish I could figure. I haven't cracked that code yet of like how he decides on the way he does his balloon tails. He does really, really cool balloon tails. Um, yeah, mm, I'll have to check it out. Uh, that's that's fascinating. 
I have to say that, I mean, honestly, the work, your work does consistently show how much you think about this. And, uh, and it's, it's really neat to see various expressions of your system of thinking about sound and in, you know, through your own work. So obviously read Jersey's comic. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> well, Science Comics Rockets has an awful lot of sound design in it because it's about rockets, right? Oh, and yeah. th there's 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 one panel in the comic where, like, I I know I got out of line. I was really out of line with with <laughs> I everybody. Got out of line? What do you mean? Because I got mad. I I mean, I raised my voice. I got so mad, and it was about um, characters fainting. And somebody suggested that we use the word plop, which is a perfectly serviceable sound effect. But I was like, there's no way we're using plop. We're not doing plop. And I was like, it's it's clearly fwomp. It has to be fwomp because fwomp has a little bit of the trombone, the sad trombone in it. It has uh -huh. the, the airy sound of falling fwomp, right? Uh, and so you get like that that comedic pun, the, the, the sound pun, but then you also have actually something that actually represents the sound, you know? And it's not gonna be text, I'm gonna hand draw it because that's the way you do this right, you know? And, and and when I was getting worked up about it, she looked across the table and she's like, "Is this that important?" You know, <laughs> and, and it was one of those moments where I was I was getting a little bit righteous and a little bit pleased with myself because like I think about this so much, you know. And I was like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, I'm 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 being out of line on this." So, uh, but yes, there's a lot of very there's a lot of sound design in rockets that that I I really agonized over and really fussed about. And there's ones that I joyfully did, you know, it's like, oh, this is a flop boom kind of thing, because that's just what it is. But anyway, yes, that'd be a good example. It's, go to your library and check out Science Comics Rockets. Uh, I think it's also available on um, some digital lending platforms like Overdrive and whatnot. So oh, you could read, cool. try before you buy. That, add, that adds up to the circ numbers, so the library will buy more copies so more kids can find rockets. So actually, you're not um, checking it off from your library actually is a direct service to me as an author. Hmm. That's really cool. That's a, that's some good context to know. Hmm. hmm. I, uh, wow. What a, I, <laughs> it's really cool that, that once in a while we say, all right, we're going <laughs> to, we're going to let this thing out of its cage. It's time to talk about sound and lettering and comics. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm not I wonder. I wonder how you. much. I wonder if we're gonna do this more in the future because now that I'm not teaching as much anymore, it's like I don't have an outlet for this. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I think you have. There's there there is more to share because I'm pretty sure you can help other people come up with their own systems. Okay. Well, thank you, Rob. I think this was a podcast, um, and uh, we record the show every Thursday at uh, nine p.m. Eastern, no, 10 p.m. Eastern, 9 p.m. Central. We stream it live on YouTube and then we collect that as a podcast at leanintoart.com and patreon.com slash leanintoart. Thanks everybody for downloading, watching, and listening. Until next time, I have been Jersey Drozd of leanintoart.com and Jersey Drozd on Instagram. And I've been Rob Stenzinger of leanintoart.com and I am also on Instagram as Rob Stenzinger. Okay, bye. Show notes for this episode can be found at leanintoart.com. You can also follow us on Twitter at the user leanintoart, and you can reach us via email at leanintoart at gmail.com. And remember, leaners aren't wieners. Thanks for listening. Okay, I'm going to turn off the stream. Thanks, everybody, for hanging out. Thank you.